Hey everyone, this is Kevin from thechesswebsite.com, and today we're going to be looking at the Rai Lopez Steinitz defense. The Rai Lopez starts out with e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, and bishop to b5. One of the most common openings in all of chess, and the Steinitz defense is d6. Now this is thought to be a very solid but passive defense from black. The way I play it though... I'm always looking for aggressive lines. So we're going to be looking at those lines and how I like to attack it. Sometimes you may hear about a modern Steinitz defense. Uh, that's when you're playing a6, kicking the bishop back to a4, and then playing d6. But we're looking at the OG of the Steinitz defense. This is something that, you know, 100 years ago, all the world champions were playing, and that is just d6 right away. The four lines we are going to be looking at, the first one is d4. This is the main line attacking the center. The second one is going to be castling on the king side for white. Then we're going to be looking at knight to c3, normal development. And then lastly, we're going to look at the bishop taking on c6. Before we jump into the variations, a quick word from our sponsor. Our sponsor today is Raid Shadow Legends, the mobile game with millions of players online. This game is all about your champion. My favorite champion is Tervold. One of the hardest hitting damage dealers in the game. Pretty much all his skills are just pure direct damage, which I absolutely love. And knowing that this game is all about champions, Raid's going to be setting everyone up with their own free epic hero. And that is Ana. Just by clicking on the link in the description below or the QR code, you're going to get Ana. You're also going to get a lot of other perks worth $30 in value. This is for new players in the next 30 days by clicking the link. Once you go into the game, in the top right hand corner, you'll see this icon I'm pointing to. You click on that and you'll be set up with Ana as well as the other perks. The first variation we're going to look at is if white plays d4. This is the most common line. And if I'm playing the Rai Lopez as white and they play the Steinus defense, I'm typically going to be playing d4. And before we get into how black should respond, you first need to understand the threats that white has. Let's say the bishop on b5 pinning down this knight. So white's looking to push forward with d5, doubling up the attack on c6. But if black were to play, let's say a6, attacking the bishop here, Black's going to lose the center exchange. So bishop takes, pawn takes, and then after the pawn takes, if black takes on e5, well then the queens are going to exchange off the board, and then knight takes e5 with the threat of taking on f7, forking the rook and the king, as well as attacking the pawn on c6. You can see white's already up a pawn of material. That's not going to work. The only other option black could try is if instead of this exchange on e5, maybe they play bishop g4, trying to pin down the knight. Well, white has the move queen d4. And you say, well, what exactly is this move doing? Well, let's say after the bishop takes, pawn takes f3. Now, if the pawn takes e5, then white can take with the queen here, check. And then after the queen e7, then we could just see the queen come back here and you can see white is up still that pawn in material as well as if you look at black situation, they have double pawns on the C file and they're isolated. So it's not too bad if you have double pawns as long as they're not isolated, meaning as long as they have a pawn on either side of it, preferably on this D file. So if we come back, uh, maybe we don't do a six uh, from from black. What if we do h6? Kind of give you an idea from the other side. Okay, well, then the pawn can just take in the center of the board. Bishop takes, pawn recaptures, queen takes here, and you can see it's still not going to work. So uh, black has to have other ideas than playing a6, h6, anything besides attacking this pawn on d4. So black's going to be taking here on d4. The most common line from white is to capture with their knights on d4. And then black's going to be playing bishop to d7. Now here's where I start to play a little bit different than people have in the past. Usually white's going to castle on the king side. They could play knight to c3. A lot of players would play bishop to e7 here, then knight to f6, castle on the king side. You can see it starts to get to be a cramped position. Instead, I really like playing g6. Now we're fianchettoing our bishop to g7. 
We can get our knight involved into the game, castle on the king side. But you can see it's more of a modern approach where we're using our bishop on g7. Gives us a little bit more breathing room. And then we control these dark squares in the center of the board. You can see white does not have their central uh, dark square, which is typically on the d4 square. And so this is a, a good setup here. We also have the bishop on d7 blocking uh, this attack on uh, the c6 square. And so at the end of the day, this is the approach that I like to use if they play that pawn to d4 early on. The next variation we're going to look at is if white castles on the king side. And in this variation, I like to get pretty aggressive and play something you don't see all that often, and that is the move g5. It starts to put a lot of pressure on our opponent once we play g4. Now, knowing that we're extending on the king side, white's almost always going to play d4. If they don't, I think it's a big mistake for them. They have the better pawn structure. Controlling the center of the board is really all they need to do. But black's looking to be pretty aggressive, going against what you would typically think in the old Steinitz defense, but that's okay. After g4, white has three different options. One, they could try to get aggressive with their knight, knight to g5. It is protected by the bishop on c1. It could just come back on e1 and say, okay, yeah, uh, go ahead and take the advantage right now. I'm going to bring back my development to the first rank here. Or they could just counterattack themselves and say, you know, d5. Say, if you want to attack our knight, that's fine. I'm going to go ahead and attack your knight. So we're going to look at all three of those. If they play d5, we're going to play a6. Now they could take with their pawn or their bishop. If they take with their pawn, it's probably worse. We take with our pawn. We're still attacking their knight. And that's key to remember here. If they don't take our pawn on b7, it's pretty much just a free pawn for us. So that's going to be good. And they still have to worry about their knight here. Uh, the only way they can even wor not worry about their knight right away is if they play pawn takes b7. Because now they're attacking our bishop and our rook. So we have to deal with that. But we take it with our bishop. And all of a sudden our bishop is in a really good spot. It's in a great square. It's attacking the long light square diagonal. Not a very good position for white. Now if they take with their bishop instead. A little bit better. But you usually don't want to be giving up your bishops early in the game. We take it with our pawn. Now, maybe they play knight to uh, g5 is one option. But we play h6 and it gets tricky because what do they do? They just sacrifice on f7. There's no other good square. This is another position where they're almost forced to just come back to e1. Then we take on d5. They take with their pawn and then bishop g7. And you can see white has no pieces developed past this second rank here except the pawn on d5, where black has a lot going on. Yes, they don't have the strongest king side protection uh, with the, the pawns, but that's okay. There, there's a lot that black has going for it, and this is not your typical passive defense. Now, if we come back, let's say they don't play d5. Let's say they recognize their knights under attack, and so they play knight to g5. Okay, well, first we can go ahead and take their pawn here. Let's say they take with their queen. Then we can play f6. That queen was attacking our rook on h8. So this not only stops that, but it also attacks the knight on g5. So that's something to keep in mind. Then we can get our bishop involved into the game. This is a pretty good setup for us. We can also, if we want to get our light square bishop involved into the game, a6 at some point to attack the bishop. Uh, but that's how I would do it if they play knight to uh, g5 if instead of bringing the queen to d4 maybe they play bishop c4 putting their knight and their bishop both attacking the pawn on f7 in that case i would play knight to h6 this knight defends the pawn on f7 but instead of playing knight to e5 because now the queen can capture on d4 so this knight also protects the f7 square but i really like keeping the knight on c6 it's no longer pinned by the bishop on b5 and so it still protects the pawn here on d4 so last thing we're going to look at is if they come back to knight e1 okay well now they've moved their knight twice it's back on the e1 square it's blocking the rook from f1 getting involved into the game so this is where black really needs to be aggressive you probably can guess right away we're going to take that pawn on d4 trying to control the center of the board 
if they take with their queen, we can't capture with our knight. If you look at it and say, why would they actually play that? Our knight is being pinned down by the bishop. That's fine. But now we can play knight to f6 here. Maybe bishop g5 pinning down our knight to the queen. But then bishop g7. Always want to be looking to bring our bishop to g7. Fianchetto and really that modern approach of controlling the center by putting our minor pieces on the side aiming towards the center of the board. So that's how I approach it early on if our opponent plays castle on the king side. I like to be very aggressive, playing g5. Not your normal approach that you typically see, which is bishop to e7, potentially just bishop d7. I think those are way too passive, and there's a more aggressive approach, and that's pawn g5. The next variation we're going to look at is if white plays knight c3 simple development move. In this case, we're going to play bishop d7. We're not going to push forward with g5. White has not committed to the king side by castling, and so we don't want to do that right away. Instead, bishop d7 stopping the pin right away. In this case, they could decide to capture. We'll look at what happens if they don't, but if they do, that's fine. Hey, we play bishop takes c6. Maybe now they push in the forward with d4. We're going to play knight f6. Maybe they castle on the king side. We could have an exchange in the center of the board. Although it looks like we are up a pawn in material, white is able to capture that back. Rook to e1, attacking the bishop. We can exchange if we feel like we need to. Bishop to e7, preparing to castle on the king side. Pawn takes on e5. And after the pawn takes, uh, maybe the rook takes on e5. And then we castle. And part of the reason I like castling here, one, you always want to get king safety, but it's a trap. Uh, if you do reach this position, if you look at it, white may say, hey, I can go ahead and take this pawn on b7. But if they take, they would actually lose the game. Queen to d1. The only way to stop it is rook to e1. And then checkmate after queen takes e1. So in this position, the queen can't actually capture. Both sides are fairly equal in material. We're getting down towards the end game. Again, this is why I think this is one of the, the drawlish variations in the Steinitz defense. Now, if we come back, what if the bishop does not take? Because not many people are going to be taking on c6, although it does happen sometimes. But let's just say they try to control the center with d4, since it is one of the most common ways to continue. We're going to go ahead and take on d4. That's almost always our go-to. Knight takes d4. We're going to play g6. Remember, we're always going to be looking to bring our bishop to g7. Fianchetto, control the center with the dark square with the bishop on g7, and then castle on the king side. The last variation we're going to look at is if the bishop takes on c6. Now, some players will never give up their bishop early on. I think that is a good decision. I think just giving up your bishop is a, a poor move here. But sometimes they'll look at it and say, hey, you have double pawns. Just know that double pawns are not always bad, especially if they're towards the center of the board and they're not isolated, meaning they do have pawns on either side of them. Instead, this can actually really control the center and make it more difficult for your opponent. Let's say they play knight to c3, which we just looked at previously. Knight to c3 gets difficult because of c5. Now we completely control this d4 square. They can't just play d4. We take it. Now it's protected by the pawn. So they can't even, even though they have both the knight and the queen attacking this, they can't take on d4. We completely control it. So they really can't play c3, knight to c3. That's a poor move. Let's say they play d4. Okay, well, now we can just go ahead and take with our pawn. They take over their queen. We play knight to f6. They play knight to c3 here. But then how do they really break through? We can be in keto at some point. Uh, more than likely, though, at this point, because of their queen on d4, it gets a little tricky when you start fianchettoing to the king side if their queen is on d4. We could always kick it away, something like pawn c5, uh, but we also have the option of bishop to e7, castle on the king side, more of a traditional approach of king side safety. We're definitely not going to be castling on the queen side. And then our bishop at any time can get involved into the game. So that is the Steinitz defense in the Rye Lopez. The, this is the old Steinitz defense. If you guys want to see a video on the modern approach, which at the beginning of the game 
instead of just the d6 right away is more that a6 forcing the bishop to come back here and then playing d6 happy to make a video on that as well uh, but hopefully this gives you some ideas on how you can play d6 and feel confident that you have a great position that you don't have to just play the passive lines and you actually have some aggressive ways to combat white's line so uh, thank you guys so much for watching the video. Thank you to the sponsor uh, for this video. Let me know in the comments below what you thought of this and if you have any other recommendations for future videos. But thanks again. I'll see you guys in the next video.